Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we're based here in the UK, all times are in GMT. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 23rd to the 29th of December. I'm Ezzy Pearson, the magazine's features editor, and I'm joined on the podcast today by Mary McIntyre. Hello, Mary. Hi, Ezzy. It's great to be here for the Christmas week. Yes, Christmas week is upon us. So do we have any festive things to see in this week's night sky? We certainly do. We've got another excellent planetary parade this week with six planets visible at once in the evening sky and a seventh one appearing before dawn. We've got Io playing hide and seek with Jupiter. We've got two Christmas stars, a Christmas tree and possibly Santa in his sleigh as well. So lots to see. So where do we start this week? It has to be the planets. They're just putting on such an amazing show. I I can still remember over the summer when there were just no planets visible and we said, don't worry, it's going to get better. And and it is better. It's just awesome. We're going to be able to see six planets at once in the evening sky. As we said last week, they're not all in a cluster in one place. They are following the line of the ecliptic from the east all the way over to the west, spaced out along that ecliptic. But it is always amazing when you can see six planets at the same time. So starting with Venus, which is absolutely unmissable in the southwest once it starts to go dark, because that is blazing at mag minus 4.4. That's now setting at 8 p.m., so we've got plenty of time after dark to have a look for that. And that is going to really resemble that kind of classic Christmas card star of Bethlehem kind of vibe when you look to the southwest because it's just so bright. And even in the twilight sky, that just looks so unbelievably beautiful. If you look for Venus on Thursday, the 26th and Friday, the 27th, it's going to lie very close to Deneb al Gedi and Nashira, the two stars that are in Capricornus. Saturn lies in Aquarius. That is about 29 degrees above the southwest when it gets dark, and that is going to remain visible until 10 p.m. It's 100 times fainter than Venus, mag plus one, but you should still be able to see Saturn quite easily with the naked eye and with binoculars and a telescope. Even though the rings are almost edge on right now, you should still be able to see the rings if you've got a good clear night. They haven't quite disappeared yet. Not Give quite. it a couple of months. <laughs> Neptune and Uranus are also visible. Obviously, both of these are going to need optical aid because they're a lot fainter than their other planetary counterparts. So first of all, Neptune is about 14 degrees to the left of Saturn. It's located between Aquarius and Pisces and sets around 11.15 p.m. That's at mag plus 7.8. So that is the more difficult of the two outer planets. Uranus is located between Aries and Taurus and is still located about seven degrees to the right of the Pleiades star cluster. So that's going to remain visible until 4.50 in the morning. And that is mag plus 5.7. So that is definitely easier to spot. Our second Christmas star is Jupiter, which lies in Taurus and is absolutely unmissable in the eastern sky after dark. It's at mag minus 2.8 and it's actually in the east. So this Christmas star is in the east like the original Christmas star. So again, great photo opportunity. Jupiter is visible all night long because it reached opposition earlier this month. So it's going to be pretty much visible from sunset to sunrise. On the 27th, Friday the 27th at 5.35 p.m., Io is going to disappear behind Jupiter. We talk a lot about the moons passing in front of Jupiter and casting a shadow on Jupiter's surface, but the moons go behind Jupiter as well. And what's particularly interesting about this one is that we can very often forget that the planets themselves cast shadows in space. So Io will disappear behind Jupiter, but when it emerges again, it doesn't emerge from the limb of Jupiter. It emerges about a fifth of Jupiter's diameter away because it's essentially eclipsed by Jupiter's shadow when it comes back out. So that's another one, like like last week's occultation. Sometimes the moon or the star doesn't appear where you think it's going to because there's a bit that 
is shadowed or not illuminated or something. So it plays tricks with you a little bit. So it's always good fun to watch these and just have that, you know, these are bodies that are in orbit with sun shining on them and they're all casting their own shadows out into space. And we always are very acutely aware of this during eclipses of our moon or of the sun. But the rest of the time, I think we forget that all the planets have shadows that are just being projected right out there into space. It's important things to remember that quite often in astronomy, it's the things that you don't see can tell you as much as the things you can see. You know, like when a star winks out or something like that, that's, you know, an asteroid has gone past or something like that. So it, you can learn a lot from what's not there as well as what you can see. Yeah, so definitely look for that one. It's always good fun to see the moons emerging from behind Jupiter as well as seeing them passing from. Mars is in Cancer this week. That is rising in the northeast at around 6pm and then remains visible all night long. That's going to be mag minus 1.2 by the end of this week and even brighter next week. So Mars is really going to put on a good show for us in the coming couple of weeks. Mercury lies in Scorpius and it reaches greatest western elongation on Christmas Day. So if you're an early riser, it rises in the southeast at 6.20, about two hours before sunrise. So if anyone's got you up early because they're excited <laughs> about Christmas, have a look out and you'll spot it there at mag minus 0.3. So it will be quite bright and putting on a really nice show. I was going to say most people will be lying in on that day. And then I realised, no, no, they won't. If you've got children under a certain age <laughs> or you've got to get up because dinner's got to be ready in six hours and it's going to take seven to cook then <laughs> you might just want to have a nice quiet moment outside taking in some cosmic sights definitely on Saturday the 28th of December Mercury is going to be just 11.3 degrees to the left of the 7% crescent moon and I do always love a planet and crescent moon conjunction so although they're not super close together they will be nicely in the same part of the sky this week, we're going from a last quarter to an almost new moon. And again, on Christmas Day, before dawn, the 29% waning moon is going to be 4.5 degrees below Spica. And if you look at the moon through binoculars, then you will see the sun beginning to set over the sinus iridum region. We talk a lot about the sun rising there and looking at the jeweled handle, but this region is stunning when the sun is setting over that region. And I think we're great at sunrises, but we don't often talk as much about the sun setting over these gorgeous parts of the moon. So if you are up early on Christmas Day, have a look for that as well. And um, you should be able to see that with a telescope or large binoculars. Comet Suitsin Shan Atlas is still making a slow progress moving through Aquila. It's passing through part of the Milky Way and that's setting at about quarter to eight in the evening. It's going to be fading to around about mag plus 10.5. So it will be a challenge, but there's no moon this week. And the week that this comet was at its best, the moon just battered it like i am used to observing comets i could not see this comet with the naked eye whatsoever then a week after its best it was just so easy to see because the moon wasn't bleaching the sky so even though this is still going to be a challenge the moon out of the way should hopefully make it that little bit easier to spot than last week it's sometimes the thing that you're looking at might not be at its best but if everything else is cooperating then the best time to look at the night sky is when there aren't any clouds so <laughs> you know sometimes you just have to take what you can and if it's not the absolute best it could have been then that's astronomy yeah i can't get mad at the moon for doing this because i do love it but it is a bit of a nuisance for faint objects for sure <laughs> We'd miss it if it wasn't there, mainly because they think, well, one of the theories is that the moon is, you know, one of the primary things that helped life on Earth evolve with the tides and so on. So we do need the moon as much as some astronomers would like to blow it out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> And the minor shower, meteor shower, the Ursid meteor shower, which was caused by debris left behind by Comet 8P Tuttle, that is a very narrow peak. The peak was actually on Sunday the 22nd, but this is actually active right the way up until Christmas Day. So with the moon out of the way, you may spot a couple of stragglers. It's it's a very, very narrow peak. So really, you're just going to see the odd one, possibly two, but it's not going to be particularly spectacular. But it's worth mentioning because the shower is still active until Christmas Day. I always forget just how short the Ursids meteor shower is. Because most of them, they're like going on for like at least a couple of weeks, if not a month. But nope, there is just like 
six days and I'm gone. Bye bye. Yeah, <laughs> it, I find it fascinating how different they all are, and like the the meteor camera networks are really helping get a handle on the debris fields of all of these showers. They all have their own personality. They They're do. They're all a little bit different. Uh, and that's why it's like nice to sort of watch them all throughout the well across several years because you know one year the moon will be completely washing one out but another will be great and then the next year it's the other way around so it's it's one of those things that like watching it over time and seeing how they, they change and how your view of them changes and there is completely random events so you can't exactly predict when and where a meteor will happen so every single one you see is very unique so I quite like that so as it's the week of Christmas, we have to talk about NGC 2266, the Christmas tree cluster. We do have to. It is unfortunately required by, by astronomer law. Absolutely. We have to talk about it. <laughs> so this is a great festive deep sky challenge. So if you go out at 11.15 this week, this cluster is 45 degrees above the south-southeast horizon. So it's at a good altitude. If you start off looking at Orion and you can see Bellatrix and Betelgeuse, just go about one and a half times the distance between them to the left of Orion and you will hopefully be able to locate the star 15 Monocerotis. That is a mag plus 4.6 star, and that actually forms the base of the Christmas tree. If you're looking at it through binoculars, it will be upside down, but it has this like really distinctive Christmas tree shape when you look at it through binoculars, and at the very top of the tree is a mag plus 7.2 star, HD 47887. It might help you look for it on Stellarium by giving you the star names. So that fits really nicely into the field of view of a small refractor, and with a refractor, it will be the right way up as we normally see a Christmas tree, because refractors make everything go upside down so it will look the right way up now 15 monocerotis is actually surrounded by a reflection nebula and at the very top of the tree with a larger telescope you might be able to see a black triangle cone shape that is the cone nebula and it's like an upside down christmas tree on top of a christmas tree or that one will be the right way up when the other's the right way up. But either way, they're, they're opposite way round to each other. It's like an upside down cone on top of a Christmas tree. Christmas trees within Christmas trees. Yeah, I kind of think of it as an upside down angel because whenever we used to make angels for a Christmas tree, it was like a cone shape. So it's like somebody stuck it on so upside that, so down. So it could go on the top of the tree, yeah. But a, a child did it and it went on upside down. <laughs> so yeah, it's a really beautiful cluster. It's, a ni it's one of those objects that's really beautiful to actually observe with binoculars because the stars do make that Christmas tree shape. But if you do longer exposure pictures of it, there's so much nebulosity around there and it's just beautiful on photographs. So if you are an imager, I don't know any astrophotographer that hasn't sent out a, a Christmas tree cluster photograph as their Christmas card. That's also the rule. <laughs> a really good one to, to look for. We also like to get your Christmas tree cards. So if you have any pictures that you take this Christmas of the Christmas tree cluster or the cone nebula, please do send them in to contact us at Sky at Night magazine. Or in fact, if you take a picture of a Christmas, in inverted commas, star, Venus or Jupiter, perhaps over a nice Christmassy festive landscape, please, we'd love to see them very much. So I'm just going to finish off by talking about the International Space Station. It must have been about a decade ago now. There were some really bright passes of the ISS across the UK on Christmas Eve. And every year people reshare the incorrect information because everyone said, go out at 6pm on Christmas Eve and you'll see Santa in his sleigh. You can show your children. It was a great thing to do, but it was only valid for that one year because the ISS orbit doesn't coincide with our calendar. If you do want to show your young children something flying through the sky that looks like it could be Santa, we have two opportunities this week because the International Space Station is visible with some very high and bright passes before dawn. So on Christmas Eve at around 7am, if you look out, you'll be able to see Santa getting ready to take presents around the world. On Christmas morning at 10 past six on Wednesday the 25th on Christmas Day, you can look up and see him as he goes away after leaving presents. So I, I actually think it's almost cooler to tell them that there are astronauts on that thing and that it's in orbit around the Earth and moving at 17,000 miles per hour. But for young children, the magic of actually seeing that bright thing past the sky and think it's Santa, there is something quite magical about that. So whichever one of those you think is cool to tell your children, you've got two chances. 
it can be Santa's support crew exactly. up on the ISS. They're watching over him from above. That way you get both options. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's everything for this week. If people do want to get up to date information about the ISS, we have several guides over on our website, skyatnightmagazine.com, telling you how you can find out where the ISS is going to be in exactly in the sky, how you can track it for yourself. So I'll put those links in the show notes below and you can head over there and look at those for yourself. Thank you very much, Mary, for taking us through that week. There's lots and lots of things to see over this Christmas week. So hopefully, if you've got some time off, you can take some time to go out there and look up at the night sky and really enjoy the cosmos around us. We'll be back next week for our New Year's episode where we'll be looking forward to what's coming up in the next year as well as what's going on over the week of the New Year with Katrin Rayner. We'll be back on the show. And if you want to catch that episode, subscribe to the podcast today to make sure that you catch every single episode and all the latest stargazing highlights. But to summarise this week again, there's an impressive lineup of six planets in the evening sky all week, with the seventh visible just before dawn. The moon's going to move from last quarter to almost new as well. On Monday the 23rd, look for some late Ursid meteors. On the 24th of December at 7am, there's a bright ISS pass that looks like Santa in his sleigh getting ready to deliver presents. In the evening, Venus and Jupiter will also look like a pair of Christmas stars as well. And then on Wednesday, the 25th of December, Christmas Day, the waning crescent moon lies below Spica just before dawn. You can see the sunset over Sinus Iridum. And at 6.10am, we have another bright ISS pass that looks like Santa and his sleigh again. On Thursday, the 26th of December, that's Boxing Day for us over here in the UK, Venus is going to lie very close to Deneb, Algedi and Nishira. On Friday, the 27th of December, Io disappears behind Jupiter, then emerges again behind Jupiter's shadow. And on the 28th and 29th of December, Saturday and Sunday, if you've got a telescope or a pair of binoculars for Christmas, why not use them to look towards Orion and use it to help you locate the Christmas tree cluster and the cone nebula along with them. That's it from us. Thank you very much for joining us for this festive episode. We wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas and we'll see you all again in the new year. From all of us here at Star Diary, goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our Sky Guide has got you covered with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes, or your favourite podcast player.